Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm David Wooding, uh, and I cover politics for the, the new Sunday edition of The Sun. Back in journalism after nine months enforced maternity leave, as I call it. Um, class is a communist concept. It groups people together and sets them against each other. Not my words, but those of Margaret Thatcher. And we're here today to talk about class and politics. Notice how I said class. Straight away, uh, the flat vowel, you put me in a certain class. Some of you here may say class. In fact, when I say we're in class, you know exactly where I come from. Um, in fact, uh, I was brought up in a working class a community in Liverpool, Liverpool 8, and uh, now I work in politics. So I'm very interested personally in the uh, engagement of working class people uh, with politics. Um, every time I see the politician Sam Hughes, I think of a boy who was in my uh, school down in the Dingle called Sam Hughes, who was very naughty. And every time the teacher told him off, he'd say, Hughes, stand up! And the whole class would stand up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now politicians of all parties have tried over the years to get rid of uh, Britain's obsession with class. There was John Major, remember him and his famous classless society. And there was Tony Blair, who said once, we're all middle class now. But perhaps he was only referring to MPs and not to the public in la at large. For um, the next hour or so, we'll be exploring why so many voters, working class voters, seem to be disengaged from politics and why MPs today seem to be a mixture of public school tops, middle class policy wonks and career politicians who've never done a day's hard graft in their lives. Where are the working class heroes among us? The people who came through the trade union ranks, um, the self-made businessmen and women who've worked their way up the hard way, and local town hall politi politicians who've gone from parish council, to borough council, to county council, to the building across the road here. Are they necessarily any good in the first place? The last two working class politicians I remember to reach the top um, were John Prescott and John Major. Would we rather have highly educated public school boys like Tony Blair, David Cameron, Nick Clegg, the believers of power, or do we want more working class people in here? Now here to discuss the decline of the working class, MP, is a classless panel and a classy panel. Uh, they all have one thing in common, they're all far more middle class than me. <laughs> now, Hazel Blears, <laughs> Hazel Blears um, needs no introduction. She's one of those um, rare breeds, increasingly rare breeds of MPs, uh, who've risen from humble beginnings to high office in government. Uh, she was born and brought up in Salford, where she rose to fame at a very early age when she proved her working class credentials uh, by playing a street urchin in the 1960s film A Taste of Funny, which starred um, uh, Rita Tushingham and Dora Bryan. Um, now, at risk of, uh, of giving away Hazel's age, I'll tell you that it was filmed in black and white. Um, um, Hazel was educated at a local grammar school. What many people say it was good for working class people. In sixth form college, and before going on to university and law school. And while working as a solicitor, she entered public life as a councillor, uh, community health council, before becoming elected MP for Salford as one of the first Blair babes in 1997. And since then, I remember working with her quite a lot um, as a political journalist, came in the same year to cover politics, uh, when she held ministerial posts at the Department of Health and the Home Office and then into the cabinet <coughs> as the Labour Party chairman and communities and local government secretary of state. Rather good minister she was too. Um, now, who else have we got? Sean Bailey. Um, he's a prime example of why we don't have enough working class MPs. He stood for the Conservatives as a candidate in Hammersmith and Fulham in 2010, uh, but wasn't elected. Luckily, he was rescued by David Cameron, who was keen to have somebody from the real world in number 10. Now, he works at the PM's big society ambassador, where he does behind the scenes a lot of hard work, which will, and he allows him to argue the little man's case, and occasionally he causes a bit of trouble in there too, I'm told. Um, Owen Jones is a self-confessed lefty, uh, who was brought up 
on the banks of the Mersey, sadly at the narrow end of the Mersey in Stockport. Um, not far from Hazel's uh, neck of the woods. Um, uh, he's packed a lot into his into the past few years since he left university. Uh, he's worked for the union movements, he's done some work for MPs, and he's probably most well known for his book uh, called Chav, The Demonization of the Working Class. I don't know if that's a class or a class, we'll find out very shortly. Um, we don't have time to discuss exactly what a chap is, but you know, uh, and whether they are in fact working class. But personally, I must say, I've never associated Chelsea fans with being working class. <laughs> um, David Skelton uh, has worked in politics for over a decade, and he's the deputy director and head of research for the Policy Exchange, who are hosting this fine event today. He's worked extensively in the private sector and with uh, serious politicians and decision makers with a focus on public sector reform. He has also written regularly for publications which are enjoyed by masses of working class people like uh, The Guardian, um, The New Statesman, um, The Prospect and um, Platform 10. I think the next thing we have to do after this is talk to David and get to write for the sun on Sunday. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to call our excellent panel to, uh, to do some work for us um, and tell us why the, uh, the working class MPs are no more and why we why we're not dis why they're disconnected from politics. Hazel. Well, thanks very much, David, and thank you for that lengthy introduction. It did sound slightly like an obituary, um, but I can assure you there's life in this this woman yet. So uh, it's great to be here. Uh, what David didn't tell you was that when they came to film a taste of honey in my street in Salford. Uh, the director asked for all the children to go out with the extras, bouncing balls, singing that song, that if you remember, the big ship sails on the alley alley -o. Um And my mum, being the good working class woman she was, uh, sent us out in our best clothes, our whip week walk clothes, um, and the director said, oh no, no, this won't do. He said, T you've got to go back in and tell your mum to put your worst clothes on you. Uh, and my mum was hugely insulted that she had to send her children out looking like urchins, but nevertheless, uh, we did manage to get in the film. Um, I've come to this issue, I think, um, partly out of my own personal experience. David told you that I came up through local government, um, also through my trade union background. Um, actually, it took me 12 years to get to Parliament. Um, I fought an unwinnable seat in 87, a marginal seat in 92, uh, and then finally uh, got the seat where I live uh, in 97. So it was a bit of a long haul, really, uh, for me to, to, to get to Parliament, having already done uh, 10 years as a local councillor as well. Um, it just set me to thinking about what I are the different kind of routes uh, that people get to politics. Uh, and actually three years ago, when I was in the cabinet, I made um, a speech to the Hansard Society, uh, in which I first started to raise some of the issues that I was worried about. Uh, and I took the speech out, um, and uh, if I just read you a little bit from it, I said, politicians mustn't live on planet politics and behave in ways which are alien and strange to the electorate. And I said then, this happens partly because there's a trend towards politics being seen as a career move rather than a call to public service. And increasingly, we've seen a transmission belt from university activist, MPs researcher, think tank staffer, special advisor to member of parliament and ultimately to the front bench. And I said then that there was nothing wrong with any of those jobs in themselves, but I thought it was deeply unhealthy for our political class to be drawn from a narrowing social base and range of experience. And I believe today, uh, probably even, even more, uh, that this position is bad for our democracy, bad for the way that we live in the country, uh, and that it's really essential that we try and do something to reverse this trend uh, of it simply being a political career path uh, into Parliament. Um, and I said that we needed people from a range of backgrounds, from business, the armed forces, scientists, teachers, the NHS, shop workers, to make good laws. Um, and if you think about it, uh, we, we talk a lot about how company boards now need to be more representative uh, of people as a whole, more women, people from different backgrounds, so that when you're having a discussion about your company, you get some real uh, grit into the debate, you get some different points of view. Now, what is the British Cabinet if it isn't the board of Great Britain PLC? Uh, and therefore, having people who simply come from the same background, the same life experience, uh, is wrong in two ways for me. It can lead to groupthink, in which it's very difficult to challenge the established wisdom on that group, 
Uh, and I say from, from hard personal experience that occasionally it was quite difficult to be the voice on the end of the cabinet table um, that said, hang on a minute, you know, uh, do we really want to do this? Is that really what we should be doing? Um, and the dynamics, I think, of government at that level uh, really do inhibit people often uh, from saying what they really think. And yet it's important for the good of the country that those views should be um, a, a wide variety of views and be able to be freely expressed. Well, after I made that speech, now, I think I made it on a Monday night to the Hansard Society and the next morning I walked into the cabinet uh, and I sat where I always sat and I sat next to my very good friend James Pennell uh, and he said to me, Hazel, he said, uh, this speech you made last night about special advisors and uh, transmission belts politics, he said, uh, you having a go at me? And I thought, ooh, uh, <laughs> this is going to be difficult. Uh, and then Ed Miliband, I think it was, said to me, uh, yeah, I was a special advisor. Um, and then David started moving in his seat. And then my, my really good friend, who sat on my other side, is Andy Burnham. Uh, and he said to me, yeah, I was a special advisor. And I thought, oh, goodness. And then we had Ed and Yvette and uh, Sean Woodward and, you know, a whole range of people. And in the end, I just said, well, you know, gentlemen, I think you've made my case for me. <laughs> and I managed to get away with it like that. Um, but I've felt passionately about this, this issue um, for, for really a long time. And I just want to go through um, a, a few kind of um, facts, really, about where we are at the moment. Uh, and then perhaps just to say a couple of things about what we might do about it in practical terms. Uh, because when I came back to Parliament after the last election, I thought it's no good just keep making speeches about this and saying it's wrong. You've got to really try and put in place some mechanisms, some ways in which you can change the system uh, if we're actually going to, to address the problems. Um, but where we are now, I think, is a very difficult position for us. Um, at the last election, we've got 35% of our MPs who went to private school, compared with just 7% of the general population. And that's gone up since 2005. It's gone up by 3%. Uh, the 91% um, of our MPs have attended university. It's the highest figure for any parliament uh, to date. And obviously, that's a reflection of more people in the general population going to university. But 91% said it's virtually a graduate profession now. Um, and only 40% um, of Labour MPs haven't been to university, 12% of Lib Dems and 5% of, of Tory MPs. So it's very much now um, a, a graduate position. If you look at the career path, in 1979, just 3.5% of uh, MPs of all parties came from political background, researcher, special advisor, and um, perhaps trade union, political officer. Um, the House of Commons figures now put that at 14.5%. But actually, the Smith Institute have done their own research, and the figure as, uh, in, from their research is now 24%. So virtually a quarter of all of our members of parliament have come up through this political route, the transmission belt that I referred to in my speech three years ago, and that situation uh, is increasing. Uh, we're also finding that more and more of our MPs are based in London, visiting their constituencies, and inevitably, I suppose, if you've come up through the political career route, then you are naturally going to be based uh, in the capital, and therefore you'll begin to lose that connection that we have people actually living in their constituencies. In our cabinet, there were very few of us who lived in the constituencies and came to London, rather than the opposite way around, living in London and going up to the constituencies. Um, it isn't just class that's wrong with our parliament. You know, we've, we've been over the issues about women's representation, people from ethnic minorities. Um, and indeed, even if you have all women shortlists, as our party's done and the A-list that the Conservatives have done, the danger is that you'll get more women, but you'll get perhaps more middle class women, rather than being able to bring people in uh, from right across the, the spectrum. Now, um, I, I think that there's a couple of reasons for why this is a problem. Uh, clearly, more people are now self-defining themselves as middle class. I think Tony Blair said we're all middle class. John Prescott even said we're all uh, middle class now. Uh, and that has changed. Uh, in 1986, only 28% of people uh, self-assessed themselves as middle class. And by 2005, that had gone to 40%. So there's much more of a balance about the way people uh, see themselves now. Um, but also we've seen the massive reduction in manufacturing, um, in jobs like mining, um, you know, virtually no uh, MPs from mining background because there's virtually no mining uh, in the country as well. So there are some genuine reasons why we've seen this change, uh, but, but I don't think that they account entirely uh, for the situation that we found ourselves in. If you look at party selections, the kind of skills that are often um, sought for candidates are things like communication leadership, management skills, and those are very often skills not associated with people from traditional working class backgrounds. And I think that whole selection process in all parties has now narrowed the field into what are we looking for in a member of parliament. 
I think lots of people don't know what the job of a Member of Parliament is, and that means that people don't come forward, because a lot of working class people think you do need to be good at all these middle class things, and therefore I can't possibly do it. A huge amount of a Member of Parliament's job is about being in touch with people, about doing the surgeries, about understanding people's problems, finding practical solutions. You know, those are not exclusively middle class skills. The ability to empathise and to have practical um, ideas about how you can change uh, the world um, for, for the better um, are not exclusively the preserve of the middle class. But we've got this notion in our head now that almost you have to be a McKinsey consultant uh, in order to put yourself forward for Parliament. Um, and I think that that's very wrong indeed. Um, and it's, not, it's, it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, the less working class people you have in Parliament, the less role models there are, the less mentors there are, and there are not people there who look like me, who talk like me, who do say class, who have a Liverpool accent or a Manchester accent, uh, and the more you get this uh, homogene homogeneous mass of MPs who look the same, talk the same, walk the same, men and women, uh, then you, you're not going to get people to come forward. Uh, the cost of selection is hugely expensive. I think the Speaker's Conference uh, estimated it could cost between um, a couple of thousand pounds, perhaps for a, a fairly short selection, into 20, 30 thousand pounds. If you're selected as a candidate three years before the next election, and that is increasingly the case so that candidates can get embedded uh, and, and, and be campaigning, uh, the impact of that on somebody who relies on their job for their living is absolutely enormous. <coughs> Unless you've got some wealth, perhaps from a previous job, or you're, you're actually a wealthy person, and the ability to carry a constituency, particularly a marginal constituency for three years before an election is an incredibly uh, difficult hurdle to get over. Um, I, I think that there is um, also the, the fault of political parties, uh, that people are disengaged from politics, but increasingly now because um, politics doesn't have a lot of resources, which is a, another issue for today's debate, but because in general uh, resources are squeezed, uh, political parties are concentrating uh, on contacting voters who they know are likely to vote. I mean, how often have you heard from parties, we don't go on the council estate because they don't vote? And that means political contact with those voters. <laughs> election after election after election is narrowed down into the people who are likely to vote and increasingly the people who are likely to vote for you then the political connection and political engagement is becoming less and less. And again, that means people from the council estate are not going to put themselves forward for selection. You've never been in touch with them. You've never talked to them about politics. And that makes a big difference. Um, some people think if we had open primaries, like America, this would make a difference. Um, I've done a bit of research into the, um, the, the Congress. Um, and in the latest Congress, it's even worse than we are here, perhaps unsurprisingly. 37% come from a political background. Uh, there were 37 mayors, nine state governors, uh, two state first ladies, three former cabinet secretaries, two former secretaries of the Navy, a vice admiral, uh, so we've got some forces in there, uh, various uh, Defence Department staff, uh, three state Supreme Court justices, I don't know how we'd get on with that if we had there in Parliament, uh, and, and a federal judge. Um, 540 members of Congress, uh, in, which there are, included 109 former congressional staffers. Um, and 16 former White House staffers as well. So in America, uh, the situation actually is even worse than us. Uh, they've got more celebrities maybe, we've got one or two now. Uh, they've got three professional musicians, a screenwriter, a baseball player, uh, and a football player. Um, so you know, you either get politicians or you get celebrities. And that's what our um, legislatures are beginning to, to look like. In Australia, um, I, again, I think the situation in Australia is desperate. Um, again, that is political, apparatchiks, all very much trade union members, and there's virtually no ordinary citizens in between, uh, and particularly in the Senate. And I think this is a big lesson, should we have an elected House of Lords. In the Senate in, in Australia, because they have longer terms, so it's more attractive, you don't have to stand for election every three years, you get a six-year term in Australia. Um, they're single transferable vote, so that people tend to vote the slate, um, and they don't have any constituents, so they're not accountable to constituents. So that looks like a very attractive place to get to if you are uh, basically from a political background. Um, and in the latest um, parliament in the Senate, 76% um, of senators have experience of working for the central party. Um, and in the House of Representatives, 60% have experience of working for the party. And I think Australia should be a real lesson to us in this country, uh, as I say, particularly if we go down the elected House of Lords route, uh, that that will be a place where people with uh, that kind of political background will end up. Uh, in terms of what we can do, better selection processes for all the political parties. Um, when we had a shortlist, we had a fund called Emily's List. 
which was early money is like yeast, it helps people rise to the top. I think that we need a fund like Emily's List for political parties to encourage people who can't afford to carry the cost of selection, uh, who don't have that kind of uh, backing behind them. Um, I think we should look at the qualities that we look for in candidates so that we really want to get to what makes a good MP, what makes somebody able to empathise, understand, campaign and be passionate about social change. Um, I think trade unions have a big job of work to do to find activists, not their political officer that's perhaps been a bit awkward back at the ranch that they then send to Parliament, but activists. The woman behind the tilly, Morrison's supermarket, who is absolutely passionate about childcare or um, something to do with you know, uh, the things that Udor <coughs> campaigns on, like grandparents' rights and um, all of those real day-to-day -day issues. Um, I've set up something here uh, in the last year because, as I say, I've banged on about this for such a long time, I thought I'd try and do something about it. Um, and we've now got the Speaker's Parliamentary Placement Scheme, uh, where we, we're bringing people from working class backgrounds who would never get a foot in the door in Parliament um, to be able to come and work as properly paid interns on a proper wage, help with housing, um, they work four days a week with MPs. On a Friday, they have a fantastic personal development programme uh, through the house. And I have personally raised £200,000 a year for the next three years uh, from business to enable that to happen. Uh, it's a small scheme, but I really hope it works as a catalyst for levelling the system and saying different people can come here. And I just want to finish by giving you a couple of examples of the people who started in November on our scheme, because for me, it's been absolutely life-changing. Um, James um, is from Glasgow, uh, left school at 16, got nine GCSEs, um, bright as a button, had to go to work to earn money, worked on a building site as a joiner for six years, lost his job, got made redundant, couldn't find another job, um, he applied for the scheme, uh, he's now uh, working with us and he's, he's passionate about politics, I've no doubt he's going to end up in some kind of a political career, maybe not a political advisor, um, but um, he's now working with Ed Miliband, and the people that he is meeting every single day now are changing his life. Um, Abdul, who's one of our other um, people on the scheme, uh, he was actually kidnapped at the age of eight in Liberia, forced to be a child soldier in the Civil War, um, came to this country, has funded himself through a degree and a master's, um, and wants to go and make politics less brutal in Africa. Um, they're just amazing. And they didn't have patronage, they had no connections, they would never get to come to Parliament. Uh, and Kay here, she'll hate it because I'm going to point her out there, um, with the red hair. Um, small with red, red hair, I'm from Salford. Uh, and I didn't do recruitment. <laughs> working with me and um, Kay won't mind me saying we've got a five year old little boy that we've just brought here and we've got him in place in primary school um, and Kay is changing before my eyes every single day uh, and it's one of the, the best things that I have ever done in my political life despite all those ministerial jobs actually to be able to change people's experience and to use this scheme as what I hope will be a catalyst for saying the culture of unpaid internships Asking people to come and work for six months or nine months in Parliament is wrong. It means unless you've got money or you live in London and you've got your mum and dad behind you, you have got no chance. So 95% of the people in this country would not be able to come and have that fabulous experience of being surrounded by the world of politics. So if my little scheme helps to make a bit of a difference, uh, then I know it's been worthwhile. <laughs> Uh, well, that was fantastic, Hazel. I thought that really covered uh, some of the absolutely key issues. Um, though, thanks for the intro. I am going to say class. Uh, I haven't written for the Sun Sunday. I have actually written for the Sun Bizarrely, which for a self confessed lefty, I've got a bit of a kicking for, if I'm going to be honest. But I do think this is hugely welcome that we're talking about class actually outside of the confines of where I'm from, the left. The fact we've even got policy exchange addressing this crisis, and I do think it is a crisis of working class representation shows that it is now really back on the agenda, that this is something which people are openly discussing, and I think that's hugely welcome. Um, I was actually going to use that Thatcher quote, the uh, class as a communist concept, it sets people in bundles against each other, but both the Tories and New Labour had this sense during the boom period that there wasn't any such thing as class anymore, that this was a middle class society. Actually going a little bit back before uh, Thatcher became Prime Minister in 1979, the Tories released a statement of aim saying the problem in this country isn't the existence of class, it's the existence of class feeling. And that was something which became embraced by the political establishment, that even talking about class was something which was inherently divisive. And the, 
part of one of the re one of the consequences of that is we haven't had the focus we should have done on making sure that working class people are properly represented. And I think during the boom period, there was this myth that the working class had disappeared. That if the working class was aspirational, it had joined the middle classes, leaving behind a problematic, feckless rump. And I think largely because of the recession and the way it's hitting people in sort of different ways, that has changed. But just in terms of this crisis, I mean, Hazel gave some very compelling stats, but just to feed in some others, less than one in 20 MPs come from any form of unskilled background, and with every election that has got worse. And indeed, if you look at the 1987 Parliament, a Conservative Parliament, that had far more working class MPs than the fag end of the last uh, Labour government, the Parliament then did. Um, over two thirds of MPs come from some form of professional middle class background. They're four times more likely to be privately educated. If we look at the intake from the last general election, uh, one in 10 of those new intake uh, previously worked in financial services, which was twice as many as was the case in the 1997 Labour landslide. And of course, as Hazel touched upon, the professionalisation of politics, it not becoming a service, something you do for your community. Uh, one in five of the new intake had already worked in politics. They never had a job outside the Westminster bubble. And of course, in the last Labour leadership election, other than uh, Diane Abbott, those four uh, Labour le leadership candidates had themselves never worked outside of this little region we're now currently in. Now, I just want to go back, actually, to another era uh, when things were different, and the post-war 1945 Labour government. And obviously, you had Clement Attlee as Prime Minister, but the three pillars of that government were Nye Bevan, who founded the NHS, obviously, and he was a miner uh, originally. Ernie Bevin, who started off as a farm boy and ended up representing Britain on the global stage. Herbert Morrison, Peter Manson's granddad, funnily enough, who started off as a grocer's assistant. And what was interesting is all three of those only actually got involved in politics in their late 20s. They were working class people who did jobs until their uh, late 20s, and they got involved through politics, uh, either through trade unions and local government, or a combination of the two. Now, what's changed, I would argue, is the dramatic weakening both of the trade union movement and local government, which were genuine roots, avenues that allowed working class people to have uh, a political voice. Now, when we talk about the sorts of people we want to get back into Parliament, if you like, of course, as Hazel says, there's not many miners left. If I go back home to Stockport on the wrong side of the Mersey, the people I grew up with are now generally either working in call centres or in supermarkets. And in fact, there are about as many people working in call centres now as work down the pits at the peak of the mining industry. It's over one million people. The second biggest employer in our country now is retail. In fact, that's trebled since 1980s, as such shops and supermarkets. So we don't have the industrial working class anywhere near as much, though there are still over two and a half million people working in manufacturing, but instead we have this new service sector working class, and we don't have call centre workers and supermarket workers as a rule represented um, in Parliament. Now this professionalisation and the reason we've had that, as well as, as I say, the weakening of local government and trade unions, is in part, again as Hazel said, the rise of the unpaid intern. Now that's not something just specific to politics, you have it as well, increasingly so in the media, in law, in fashion, a whole range of different professions. And what that means is if you're an aspiring working class politician or journalist from Glasgow, Manchester, even London, the idea you can live in one of the most expensive cities on earth for free for months, if not years at a time, is almost completely impossible. And what that means is those professions have become closed shops for the middle class, and that's increasingly so in Parliament. In fact, the Parliamentary Researchers you, um, a Trade Union found that even about half of MPs they surveyed weren't even paying travel expenses to their interns. Now again, how would you expect people from across the country to actually get this, what has become a foothold, the first step on the ladder in politics, um, for good or bad? Now I think the reason this is so important is uh, not just an issue of fairness, it has an impact on policy. Now, I don't know if, my, if uh, Hazel Blaze reminds me mentioning, but I interviewed uh, Hazel just before the last general election. She was very open and candid, and I thought made some very salient points. It was about housing. <laughs> um, 
And, and my point uh, to Hazel was there was up to 5 million people languishing on social housing waiting lists after 13 years of Labour government. And Hazel you know, spoke about the people in her constituency who've been stuck on a waiting list for all those years. And I said, after 13 years, why wasn't enough done about it? Hazel was very honest. She said there just wasn't enough people interested in housing in government in the way, for example, you mentioned Frank Dawson had that passion about the NHS. But of course, if you have people who've been stuck on a social housing waiting list for years, or their kids have been in that position, if we got them into Parliament, we'd be far more likely to push that right to the top of the political agenda. So it is about getting people who've lived those experiences, if you like, um, into Parliament. Now, the other issue is what's happening to our democracy. And I think actually we're seeing the unwinding by stealth of the universal uh, franchise. Because with every single election, the class gap in turnout widens. And in fact, the last election, the gap between the ABs, to use pollster categories, the ABs, the professionals at the top, and the DEs right at the bottom, was 20 percentage points. What's happening increasingly is working class people are abstaining and sitting on their hands. And it's interesting, the reasons Labour lost the election, they lost 5 million votes in those 13 years in power, and there's always this sense uh, this argument by uh, key new Labour figures that unless you keep Middle Britain on side, then Labour would lose. Now, I think Middle Britain was wrongly defined. Um, it wasn't talking about real Middle Britain, which is those on median earnings of about £21,000 a year. They were talking about quite affluent voters. But actually, what's interesting is whilst Labour lost, again to use the pollsters' categories, five percentage points in the ABs, the professionals at the top in those 13 years in office, they lost 21 percentage points among skilled and semi-skilled workers, the C2s, and at the bottom, the DEs, 19 points. And that wasn't actually because they defected to the Tories, that was because they stopped voting altogether. So what we're seeing, I think, is this is basically rotting at the heart of our democracy. People no longer feeling that politicians stand for them, that issues like housing or low wages aren't being addressed. So I think this is a crisis of political representation that everyone in politics needs to focus on and we need to work out what to do about it. Thank you. Afternoon all, can I just say I'm a special advisor to the Prime Minister. I say that shamelessly because I had many and many a poor job before that point. I have swept factories collected dead chickens, all kinds of stuff. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, what am I going to say? Um, I think the decline of working class MPs is a fact. I think the numbers are easy to track. I think there's reasons for that. I think the politics we have today is almost exclusively about what the middle class care about. There's very little of what the working class care about. It's often, there's some big social issues that are important to, to working class people, say housing that are talked about regularly. But uh, is there any real change in those things? Are people who are suffering from those sort of things on a day-to-day -day basis involved in the debate? You probably find not. So you have a, a group of um, working class people who've grown up with everything being done to them. There's no cause for them. They, don't, they have not come up in an environment where they, where they pick up their weapons and they'll fight for themselves. Everything's been provided for them and then that has a knock-on effect about if they get involved. I also think as well, the working class of this country are reasonably right wing. And the problem they have there is that they've been so heavily associated with left wing that the left wing now is basically a, a group of champagne socialists who they don't who they don't connect with. So therefore they can't go do they can't go join them. Um, the left wing definitely blocked them joining the Tory parties, you know, they, they won that half of the political game and that's and that's what you see. Much of what the working class want to talk about. Um, their natural representation doesn't want to talk about. I'll give you an example of this. It's why the BNP came back. The, the basic tactic of the BNP is to say they won't even listen to you. We're the only people who will talk for you. We're the only people who sound like you. And it's, it's given the BNP some traction. And I think it's very important for people to think, hold on a second, what is on the political arena that affects these groups of people and what are we talking about? I agree with Owen about the definition of the middle ground of politics. I, I think it's a very, very important place to look. And I also agree with this notion that people don't speak to the working classes when it comes to politics. I fought a seat that's had a Labour MP for more than 100 years. So when the posh Tories turned up, 
in the local estates because I sent them there, because I'm comfortable, it's where I came from. If you say home to me, they're the first set of things that pop into my mind. So I brought everyone to what I considered home. There was lots of shock. A, they hadn't seen any politicians before, and it was quite new to see this many enthusiastic Tories. But that is a very <coughs> telling message. Who are we speaking to, when, why, and how? We have to pick the right issues. If you go to a working class estate and start talking about European Union, it confirms for them why they don't talk to you. <laughs> if you go there and say, you know, there's a lot of dogs around there, how much costs it is, where are you going to put your kids, do you have a job, it makes politics alive to them. So part of the reason there's a, a decrease in working class is because the working classes don't hear or see themselves in politics. And that part is the responsibility of the politician. But it's also a responsibility on behalf of the working classes. Because if they don't feel represented, they should get involved. The reason I work for the Prime Minister is because I'm anxious, and I use those words, I am anxious to have the view of the little man. I don't always agree. I have massive fights with these two about what the little man wants. But at least we're, both, we're, we're all centred on that. And when I'm in number 10 and I have conversations, I always come from that point of view. I have that perspective. I cannot help it. But that enlivens the whole argument. But does that happen in our press? Like the left wing of this country think that um, work class are right because the murder press has told them that. Well, actually, it's the way they are. And they have to be spoken to. If you're a white working class person, in fact, if you're a white person in this country, I dare you to come on the stage and say something about immigration. Because you know they'll talk to you like you're racist. So therefore, you can't do it. So when you're campaigning and you have people telling you you're going to vote for the BNP, I'm quite a big black bloke, I knock on your door, you come and tell me you're going to vote for the BNP, that shows you a frustration. And it's a deeper frustration about what, where is the British political landscape. I take a step back, let's go to school. What do we teach our children about, about politics in school? Do we? Do we not at all? And the reason people can't get involved in that, I wouldn't get involved in that, because basically it then becomes a campaigning environment. So you have schools basically run by quite a, a left organisation, teaching unions, and they use it to pump that. So therefore, if you're involved in politics and you, you don't have their beliefs, you won't get involved in that. We have to figure out when do we give politics a clear, you know, it's just politics, and then when do we bring our party politics? Because what you'll find about, about England, most people are turned off by party politics. They're quite happy to have a political conversation, but they don't have a party political conversation. And if the only reason you talk to people about politics is about party politics, then you can't talk to them most of the time. And there's a thing there. Happens in school, happens on the doorstep. It's one of the first lessons you hear. If you knock on someone's door and you say, I'm from the council, the conversation starts flowing. If you say, I'm a Conservative member or a Labour member, the defence mechanism goes. You know, when and how do we speak about politics? In fact, I can never step back. It's about confidence. I come from a community where very few of us have the confidence to get involved in politics. And then if we do get involved, how we met when we come to the door. Who meets us, who greets us, who pulls us in, who shepherds us through the process. I was very fortunate for two things. One's called Operation Black Vote. And I make this clear to you, it's not about colour. Because all the white boys I grew up with, none of them are in politics either. None of them. I happen to have the mechanism of Operation Black Vote. And then my local, Conservative Party. They did simple things like, for instance, they organised babysitting for me. Because one of the biggest things where you never get a working man in politics is the cost of it. It costs a massive amount of money. When Hazel talks about this supply line, half of that is because the only real way you can be in politics is if you're paid to be there. I absolutely tell you now, I would probably try and stand at one point or other. But I couldn't do it unless I was working in the frame. How am I going to do that? Travelling up and down the country, meeting all kinds of people, coming to these meetings. You know, when I was working my security job, do you think my boss would let me come here and chuck an arrow? Yeah. I don't think so. I do not think so. But that's where you are. That's where you are. And that's why politics has become, it has become a, a real preserve of the, of the middle classes. A real preserve of the middle classes. And I also think the press have a role to play in this. Because if you're from a working class background, or you're a woman, or you're black, the myth is, if you mess up publicly, the press will hammer you extra bad. Extra, extra bad. And I use those words, extra bad. You're going to get it. So if you've got any sense, why would you open yourself up to that? And if I made a plea to the sun, it would be to talk in very cold, hard political terms about the fact that you, most of our readers, are not in this process. Why don't we get involved? Do it. Say it challenge people with it. 
The problem with that British public life is we very rarely challenge people. We have this very soft, sentimental, rubbish conversation. We don't challenge people. I would say to one of if you don't feel you're in politics, it's your fault. Get involved. There's more of you than there is of anybody else. Politics is a numbers game. So get involved. Get involved. But we all vote down the lines of our badges. So my badge happens to be blue, so I vote down that one. But if you have a local MP or a local candidate, would you really vote for that person because they will really represent what you're about? Because they're from your estate, they're from your walk of life. That's a responsibility for the public. The public have to think about who they support, how they support, and when they support. <coughs> I think the dirty nature of, of British politics is what was pretty off putting to most anybody who's, who's sane. Anybody who's sane, so hold on a second, these people, they're going to rip my life out. And why it's important, because our press, our country life, the way we speak about people publicly, so any little mistake they've made means they can't be involved, you're much more likely to have that happen if you come from a working class environment. How many of you here have got a family member went to jail? How many of you have been involved in a robbery? How many of you have got an alcoholic brother? How many of you have lived on, on, on welfare? They're the kind of things when you're working class you think, well, hold on a second, I'm not going to be rifling through that on the front page of the Sun, because they will, or on the, on the front page of the Guardian, because they will want to try to rubbish me. But the, all of those small things mount up massively on a personal level as to why you would get involved. The level of confidence it takes to get involved is, is, is shocking. I'm not involved because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> if I could realise what I was doing, I might not have done it. But I, for me, it's those important things. I speak in a lot of schools, and the possibility about being involved in politics doesn't even cross anybody's mind. When you get past that barrier, they start to talk about all the bad things that could be involved in politics. Some of it's myth, some of it's not. But I think the, the first instance is to go back to communities and say to them, actually, you can, and should, and must be involved in politics. It's the only way your issues will be represented. Because until we do that, we won't see any working class issues. All the structural things that Hazel talks about, and they talked about are facts, and they're things that should be wound back. But before we get to those structural things, it's about confidence. You think of how large working class communities are in this country, and we still can't turn out 650 working class people to come to this house to get paid and, and argue with each other. We should be able to do that, <coughs> but we can't. And that, and that stems from a confidence thing, an education thing, and then into the structural thing, how do I form politics? And, and for me, the, the thing I'll end with, I challenge you, we're all in here talking about working class people involved in politics. What have you done to encourage someone from a working class background to get involved in politics? That's not for the benefit of your own political belief. The person who got me involved in politics is a raging lefty. Raging, raging lefty. And it'd be hard to say that I'm a lefty. <laughs> it'd be very hard to say that I'm a lefty. It'd be hard. But he still pushed me into politics. Because for him, the issues of my community were bigger than his own political belief. Thank you. Thanks very much to everyone for coming. It's great to have such a good turnout for what I think is such an important topic. It's great to have such really, really good contributions from the three of the panelists. Um, it's also really good to be representing the North East on the panel, which is very <laughs> Northwestern dominated so far. Um, and I went to a, I went to a school in the North East of England, a place called Concert. And something which always strikes me when I walk around Westminster is how badly represented that kind of school is around Westminster. How, how there are so few people who went to Northern Comprehensives in and around Westminster. And how when I go back home and speak to my old, old schoolmates, they're all saying things like politics isn't for them, politicians aren't like them. And that can surely only be damaging for politics and, and for Parliament. It, it's, it's amazing looking back, um, the 33 years between Harold Wilson going into Downing Street and John Major leaving Downing Street, every single Prime Minister was educated in the state school. And it, it wasn't just the party leaders who came from more humble backgrounds. Both Labour and Conservative cabinets were dominated by people from poorer backgrounds. Indeed, Knight Bevan was confident enough to say that the old political group and the old political class was dying. Just think of names like Knight Bevan, Ernie Bevan, Norman Tebbit, Jim Callaghan, Cecil Parkinson. They were all part of the great surge of working class leaders in the post-war period. Now it's pretty clear that process has gone into reverse. 
despite fine rhetoric from politicians of all major parties about making Parliament more representative and very welcome progress in terms of race, gender and sexuality, it's clear that Parliament and political parties have actually gone backwards in terms of class. The last election was one of the only elections for the past 50 years where the proportion of privately educated MPs actually increased. And bear this in mind, 7% of the population, as I said, went to fee-paying schools. 60% of the cabinet went to fee-paying schools. 54% of Tory MPs. 40% of Liberal Democrat MPs. And there's another way of looking at it as well. In 1979, almost 40% of Labour MPs came from a manual or clerical work background. That was only 9% at the last election. And over the same, same period, the number of Labour MPs who came from a broadcasting or a journalistic background more than doubled. 11% of MPs now have a background in PR and marketing. That was close to zero in 1979, so that's changed an awful lot. It's clear whichever way you look at it, blue-collar representation in the House of Commons has diminished and diminished greatly. Why has this happened? Um, as was mentioned by both Hazel and by Owen, deindustrialization is obviously an important reason for this. And the impact that deindustrialization has had on the self-confidence of working class communities can't be ignored. Concert had one of the biggest unemployment problems in Western Europe after the steelworks closed, and it really affected the self-confidence of the town. Uh, and that really, I'm sure, is reflected in the number of working class people coming forward from those kind of communities to play an active part in public life. Also, the decline of the trade union movement. But there's something about trade union MPs today compared to trade union MPs like Ernest Bevan, John Prescott, Alan Johnson. They all came from the shop floor. They were trade union MPs who actually worked on the shop floor. Nowadays, trade union MPs are as often they're likely to be press officers, communications officers, very much white collar jobs who are, who are taking the, the, the seats that would previously have gone to working class trade union MPs. The third element of why this has happened is because of the way the parties select candidates. It was um, touched on by all, all three speakers, and I'd like to come back to this when we're thinking about solutions later on. Does it matter that we've got this decline in working class representation? Some people say it doesn't really make a difference. I think they're wrong. I think a lack of working class voices in Parliament damages politics, and I think it damages the institution of Parliament itself. I think the, the Commons derives its legitimacy from being a representative body of the nation. At a time when public respect for the Commons is at a historic low, it can only be damaging when ordinary working people look at the House of Commons and think the House lacks people who understand their experiences and who genuinely understand their concerns. Is it any wonder that many people from working class backgrounds have stopped bothering to even vote for an institution they, doesn't, they don't feel adequately re reflect them? 2010 election, only 57% of the skilled working class voted, compared to 76% of AB voters, and that's down 20% since 1992. 20% of pure working class voters, skilled working class voters, voted last time than voted in, in 1992. And as I would say, the gap between AB turnout and DE turnout was a worrying gap of 6% in 1992. It's now a chasm, it's now 20%. This disengagement from politics is rising in working class communities. That must be a worry, a concern for us all. And there must be some kind of correlation between this and the decline in the number of working class MPs. I would say that the lack of working class voices is also affecting the electability of both of the major parties. Poll after poll shows the Conservative Party is still hamstrung by its being seen as the party of the rich. A poll by Lord Ashcroft showed that many people backed off from voting Conservative at the last election because they saw the, thought the Conservatives were the party of the rich rather than the party of ordinary people. And to many people, the Conservative Party still looks gilded, it still looks quite public school, it still looks quite southern, which means that the Conservatives still have trouble resonating with working class voters. That's, that's a particular concern for the Tories when you look at the battleground is moving north at the next election, into the north and the Midlands. And the Conservatives have to find a way to appeal and empathise with northern working class voters. But there's also problems for the Labour Party as well. Labour having great problems appealing to what was once their core voting group. 
Both Labour's parliamentary party and its voters are becoming increasingly middle class, or almost the political wing of the Guardian, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, <laughs> Labour's vote among skilled working class voters plunged by 11% at the last election, and was down by 21% between 1997 and 2010. <coughs> And the party formed to inc increase working class representation in the House of Commons can now only count on 29% of the votes of skilled working class people. That has to worry Labour Party strategists as well. Given we agree that the lack of working class representation is a real issue, what can the political parties do about it? Of course, here at Policy Exchange, we've really pushed forward the education reform agenda which I think will improve outcomes for working class kids. But that's not going to happen overnight. We, we need to think of ways to improve working class representation for the next election and for the election after that. The first thing that needs to happen is political parties need to acknowledge that the problem exists. From Tony Blair's all women shortlist to the predominantly gender and ethnicity based A-list and modernization of the Tory party, political parties have tended to relegate class to a distant third when considering representation. It's no point replacing a wealthy man with a wealthy woman or a white old attorney with a black old attorney. That's not going to solve a problem of representation. It can be diversity by numbers. The result is increasingly a House of Commons that less resembles modern Britain in terms of social background and social class. And as was mentioned by other panellists, standing for Parliament, as, as I found in, in North Durham, is an expensive business. And political parties could take steps to make it more affordable to people from modest backgrounds. Even the cost of travelling to and from selection meetings adds up. And then once selected, your lost income, the travel, the accommodation can be pretty oppressive for people who aren't independently wealthy. But political parties give no real support to people from poorer backgrounds, meaning that many working class people are beginning to see politics as a career that isn't for them. At the same time, Selection processes are modelled around assessment centres for professional services firms. That obviously puts middle class professionals and university educated people at a fairly decisive advantage. Factors that might benefit working class candidates, such as emphasising service to a local community, seem to be little considered compared to those professional skills. So, Parliament is badly unrepresentative in terms of class. Too many working class people have been shut out from Parliament. And I think the politicians should find it hard to lecture people about social mobility when their own profession sets such a bad example. Finding out the needs of working class communities can't just happen through social action projects, important though they are. It needs politicians who actually understand the needs of those working class communities. We need politicians who instinctively can understand the concerns of working class people without having to turn to polls and focus groups. They know them. They, they know that the Conservatives are a part of their being. This is something that both political parties urgently need to address. Well, I will take some questions from the floor shortly. Um, but first, I'm going to have the first divot question, okay. and then uh, to, get, to get the panel warmed up. Four excellent contributions there, I thought. Um, what I'll ask you is a quick starter. Um, Britain has changed, politics has changed in the last few years. Um, the trade union movement uh, is not as powerful as it, was, as it was, the closed shop has gone, we've broken the power of the aristocracy. Our inner city communities are different, the makeup of them. And in a way, this has created a bit of a, a crisis of identity for some of the parties. And my question is, um, are the parties in the rush to the centre ground, are they, sort of, are they relevant to modern society? What do they need to do to re-engage people and get uh, new, new entrants into politics from the working classes? Should we start with Hazel? Um, I, I was just a bit shocked when you said we've broken the power of the aristocracy. Oh. I wasn't entirely <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that the biggest thing you can do is talk about the things that matter to people. Um, and I would say that to every political party. And the things that matter to people are jobs, uh, the economy, um, childcare, um, education, you know, it is bread and butter politics and I think the more that you dress it up um, as some kind of complicated pseudo-science uh, with all of its uh, special exclusive <coughs> language, you know, it's a bit like the law and, and I say this having been a solicitor, that there's a, a kind of sense that you know, if, if you 
turn something into a mystique, then somehow it becomes an exclusive thing that the only people who can do it are the people who have the language and the inside knowledge. And I think that too much of the political discourse um, is far too uh, complicated because actually politics is not that complicated. It is about running an economy, which means you can get a decent job, you can bring up your family well, your kids get a good education and they get on in life. You know, it is no more complicated than that. And that's a lesson to every political party. You talk straight about the issues that matter and you do connect with people. Um, then I think that's where politics needs to be. Oh, yeah. Well, first, in terms of trade unions, I wouldn't write them a victory just yet. They are still the biggest mass movement in the country, representing six and a half million workers, which is nine times all the other political parties' membership put together. And although they're often caricatured in the press as vested interests and parasites on the taxpayer and the rest of it, we are talking about supermarket checkout workers, people who collect your bins in the morning, dinner ladies, teachers, nurses, pillars of every decent society. And I think one of the things we can do, and I have to say, look at New Labour, there was a marginalisation of the trade unions. To involve trade union members more, to strengthen that link, particularly in the case of the Labour Party. But also, I think Hazel's right in terms of language. I think often it is about, well, when Nye Bevin says socialism is the language of priorities. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. I think, and it's interesting, the right often are better at this. As an American linguist, I forget his name, but he says the right often talk in terms of stories and the left often talk in terms of facts and statistics. People connect better with stories. I mean, one of the things which the Tories keep doing at the moment, to see Michael go at the front, is to compare the national deficit to a household budget. Now, that doesn't make any economic sense, but it does, make, it does resonate with people. You say to people, you're in debt, you don't then borrow to pay off your own debt. Instantly, you're connecting with people. But what you also don't say is that you have to pay the mortgage off all at once, do you? No, it's <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the other thing is, just, just, just a bit. Sorry to just drag Michael going into that. He's only uh, paying attention to the audience. But, uh, but it is just, it is true, actually, and somewhat short said is interesting because I don't think people uh, outside politicos like us think in terms of left and right, they think in terms of issues that have to be addressed. <laughs> Housing is one example, but also, Someone on the left, like myself, has to recognise that things like crime and antisocial behaviour, things which are more important to people in working class communities, because the poorer you are, the more likely you are to be a victim of crime and antisocial behaviour. The left has to respond to that. And if we have better working class representation, people like me will have to do that. Sure. <coughs> what to say? I think Hazel and, and Owen showed you the problem. It gets party political too early on. You know, if, if you're going to say to me, am I going to help strengthen the unions to get working class people in? I'm like, hold on a second, they get working class people not going to help my way. Not really interested in that. The, the point is, we need to. You, you need to have conversations very well. I'm, I'm going back to school. I bet you, you know, you go to most schools in this country. The kids got to tell you what the parliamentary process is. I, you know, I remember standing at, at Shepherd's Bush train station and meeting people who are educated, working in the city, and they and they said, "Oh, is it your election? I vote for you." No, no, it's Europeans. One was said, "We." We vote for the Europeans. I thought, oh my gosh, you're a grown up, you have a job and everything. <laughs> but, I mean, but the point is, people don't know. So the first thing is, what am I involved in? Why am I getting involved in politics? How is it important? Whenever you speak to young people about politics, they don't care until you make it, put it in terms that are important to them. So I say to them, you can get married, political decision. You can join the army, political decision. You can't have a credit card, political decision. Until we have politics discussed for those communities, then they, they have no need to be involved. That's the kind of thing I think we need to talk about first. How do we, we transmit our politics? Too much of our politics is driven by what the upper middle class and the press are interested in. Yeah. Um, I, I very much agree that it's important to relate politics to ordinary, everyday life. And a lot of things that you go to any club from any community from here in the North East, people are concerned about fuel bills, they're concerned about energy bills, mm -hmm. and politicians have to relate their language to the kind of language that you would hear in the pub. They have to relate their life experiences to the life experience of the everyday voter. Otherwise, the problem if you've got politics is this kind of uh, ivory towers, gilded class of politicians, and you've got kind of working class voters saying, they're not like me, they don't understand my concerns. It's really important that politicians start speaking the right language and start talking about the issues that really matter to ordinary people. And time and time again, that's shown to me as I say, things like energy bills, things like worries about unemployment, things like the cost of living. And relating that in a way that people can empathize with is really important. Not, not using, I'm, I'm certainly a think tank here, so I know I'm in the glass house, but not using kind of one language 
not talking about paradigm shifts. <laughs> but talk, talk in language that people can understand and they relate to. But the, 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 the thing why I think it can be done and may very well be done is because there's a big prize. There's a big prize there. I would, the, the, the bulk of people who don't vote would vote if they could hear that language. And you know, you troll up, when, you, when you're campaigning, the, the best thing about campaigning, you meet people who, you, who are not you, who, who, would t who don't talk like you, who don't hang around with the people that you hang around with, and you, but you hear the same messages. And if, you, if you're speaking to people, if you're speaking to the drunks on the green who are giving you the same sort of message as, as the people who live in the big houses, then it's important. And I believe there's a big prize in, in, in British politics now, and that is a, a simplification of the language. I do think you could drag an awful lot of people to your way of thinking. I think there's one point that political parties shouldn't give up on certain council estates or say we don't go there because they don't vote for us. I, I found knocking on doors in North Durham, a lot of people said it's great to have someone knock on my door because no politician's ever been here before. And an awful lot of the kind of the social group of voters who don't vote are ignored by politicians. Politicians don't knock on their door, don't listen to what they think. Well, they say you only come around at election time. Yeah, they talk. And, and, and then you, you get the kind of saloon atmosphere of Westminster where me, the media's got a similar problem as politics. And you've got a lot of people from the same social background who talk about what the big problems are, but are actually really talking to those people who are directly affected by the issue. Right, it's your turn now. Uh, hands up if you read the sun. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I'd like you all to say uh, your name and what you do. And uh, give me your address as well so these people can send people around to knock on your door. <laughs> and anybody saying class will be thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what this hand up there. Thank you. Uh, Graham Evans, MP. Um, I'm a working class lad from uh, the northwest of England, so we're well represented for a change. And uh, I agree with most of what the panel said, especially you, uh, Hazel. <clears throat> I grew up on a working uh, council house, born in a council house. I uh, didn't uh, go to university, left school with few qualifications, but I got into manufacturing. Now, in Macclesfield in those days, there was the aerospace in Woodford, uh, there was the textile industry in Macclesfield, and there was this new industry called pharmaceuticals. And I, I managed to get a job and worked in there, worked on the shop floor, into white collar work. So I do think that uh, the demise of manufacturing has a huge amount of what the panel was, uh, was saying. But uh, my, my point is, my question is, that it perhaps says a little bit about the people who do actually manage to make it from working class class backgrounds into Parliament, but my, my point is I, I do believe it's getting worse not just because of the party selections, although I do think both parties uh, have made some changes recently which may or may not help, but none of you mentioned ITSA and the way that uh, politics is now the profession of the, the wealthy, because ITSA have made that a lot, lot worse, because A, they incentivise MPs to actually live in London, because if you're from the north, you have the north-south divide, the demise of manufacturing, but it actually makes more sense now to actually set up your office and work out of Parliament because it's cheaper to do that and you don't end up in the, when the media give you the list of who are the most expensive MPs, it's cheaper actually to have your staff down in the, the House of Commons. So I do believe that the, the House authorities don't actually make it easy for working class lads like myself with uh, three young children in the northwest of England, and you're very heavily scrutinised now. So my question to the panel is that, uh, yes, parties need to do more, but um, I do think the, the parliament itself <coughs> can look at how they help working class lads get in, or ladies get in, <laughs> to, uh, in its parliament. I think we'll let Hazen ask this one first, as she was the lady who claimed that chunky Kit Kats were yeah. their expenses, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we never believed that was instead of my dinner after I bought it. But never mind, that's life. Um, I, I think, Rosie, you, you, you've hit on a real point here. Um, because I've looked around the house just recently, and I think particularly if you're either um, a married man with a couple of young children and you've only got one wage coming in, I think it's really hard now in terms of the salary that there is for people. You know, and I'm not going to be on record saying we need a rise, you know, because I'm not going to be there either. But you can, you can hardly even talk about these issues now. It's like, it's like taboo, isn't it? It's forbidden. Um, and I'm seeing people now who are perhaps not having a holiday, 
um, who, you know, I, I, I struggle with the extra expenses. Because if you're an MP, you do have to go to every function, you have to take a bottle of whiskey, you have to do the raffle, you have to do all these things. People expect it, fair enough, it's part of the job, you have a social side to what you do. Um, but if you're a, a man in that position, or indeed a woman, perhaps with a couple of kids, with no second income coming in, I think it is really quite a tough life now. And some Tory MPs have said to me that the Tory party in particular is turned into a two-tier party. You've got those MPs who've made money and have come into Parliament and actually are quite nicely suited, and they can entertain. So in the, mem you know, in the Strangers Dining Room, quite often you will see Tory MPs with a, a party constituents or business people, and it's a lovely experience to come and have a dinner in Parliament. It's really impressive. So your political influence then grows, because you can bring people to Parliament, you can give them dinner, you become big in your constituency, maybe you make contacts in business. If you're a Tory MP who doesn't have any of that, actually no, you're hard pressed to take a couple of people into the tea room or in the Pugin room and give them you know, a cup of tea and a biscuit. Um, and it is literally that level, and I think that's quite bad for politics, uh, because you're then using your position and your wealth uh, to enhance your political status. <coughs> and I think that we need to have some conversations about this, but as soon as you start to have a conversation, the current climate is so toxic for people that you can't even put these things uh, there. I mean, Graham, I, I know that, you know, because um, we've done work together, um, how passionate you are about the economy and manufacturing and jobs and all those real things. But I think you're probably a bit of an exception at the moment in your party. Sean, I'm going to bring Sean in here. Are Hazel and Graham just whinging? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm never whinging. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm a bit of a pain devil's advocate. It's my job. Um, no, I mean, £65,000 salary is a lot for a working class person. We talk about 21000 salary, uh, I think that we, we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're coming to live and work in a palace with a subsidised restaurant. The, the glamour of what they do and the chances of becoming a minister and having power is is that not attractive enough or or, or, or do you think that's sort of a, a deal that's been long? I hate to agree with Hazel, but she's right. <laughs> so here's the deal. So I remember when I stayed for Parliament, my wife came in to me and she said, if you win we're broke. Yeah. And, and I said, what do you mean? And my wife had a piece of paper explaining how much travelling I have to do. And remember, this is in Hammersmith, you can get an oyster card on the tube. And my wife was saying, so when they, because I lived about 200 metres outside Hammersmith, she said, when you go to, to this election and they ask you if you're moving to primary, you tell them your wife said no. Because you can't afford to do that. And it's a fact. But the flip side of that is, I dare one of the currently elected politicians to go and say that you need more expenses. That, that, you know, and it, it, unfortunately, they probably do, but you will never get that past the public at this point. And that's the problem. Again, I go back to the, the wider thing. We have these horrific, sentimental conversations about our public life, but nothing in reality. Because if you want working class people in Parliament, it is going to cost you. And then you're going to have to have that conversation with the public. You're going to have to have that conversation with the public. Oh. Yeah, I think we have to be careful about it. Um, I mean, it's certainly true, I mean, back in the 19th century, politics was far more even of a rich man's club than it is today. And it was the Labour movement uh, which fought for MPs to be uh, paid because before that, MPs weren't paid. And as a result, if you were a working class politician, then how were you ever going to survive? So actually being paid was something the Labour movement fought for to enable working class people to be elected. That said, we should be clear, backbench of salary puts you in the top 5% of the population. That's not true because in the amount of work you have to do, if you give me 65 grand, right, in my security job, say, and I went to the Trocadero on, on the bus and I came on, cool, I'm holidaying every year, I'll get that new Ford Focus I, I like so much, but in Parliament, when I'm buying you dinner, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a slightly different I believe that until I campaigned and then, you know, the local youth group invited me to a place, I bought a couple of table tennis bags. Then the other group invited me to a place. I remember standing with, with our local running lot thinking, what, do you want me to buy a javelin? Well, what am I to do? Javelin's like 30 quid. But it happens, it looks like a lot of money. Well, yeah, I, mean, I would say that. I mean, there are expenses. I know, obviously, they're far more heavily scrutinised, there's a lot more caveats, but expenses are still claimed for things. And the point I'd make about that expenses scandal is when we talk about often the distance many people in this country, not just working class people, feel with the political elite, that expenses scandal summed up more than anything for people. And I have to say, what disturbed me about it wasn't just what happened, but the sense that some working, uh, sorry, some MPs uh, privately said, well, look at how much they're paid in the city, look, look how much a lawyer is paid, as though they were an equivalent middle class profession yeah, rather argument. than a service. I, I accept that, you're 100% you're right there, but that's a different argument. If you're saying to someone, you're an MP for Scunthorpe, 
yeah, and to discharge your duties properly, yeah, sixty-five pounds a day. Sixty-five thousand pounds. I think it's, it's a lot. Of and that's a lot of business to, to take it out. How many kids have you got? How many kids? That's what he's saying. Now I've got two kids. Yeah, they cost. Well, most so. people bring your kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, without having to travel. Ridiculous you get travel expenses on, on, on a daily basis, and they're not going to feed you. Right, we're we not there. We're not there. Right. <laughs> you're all paying too much anyway. Uh, uh, we all know that Rupert Murdoch pays for your lunches, so don't start saying you're paying for yourself. <laughs> not anymore, though. Right, um, David, very briefly, um, is this an example of how interviews are out of touch? Graham and Hazel complain about the expenses, and should they be out there? Uh, no, they won't. It was Graham's fault for raising it. Uh, uh, just, just briefly. I have to say, it. If MPs had gone down their local pub and said that, I imagine they'd be held, held out of it. But, but what I would say is we don't want an unintended consequence of very necessary expenses before that some people think they're not going to be an MP because they can't afford it. We, we don't want the only people who are MPs to be independently wealthy or sponsored by trade unions. If you look at the speech when Lloyd George introduced paying for MPs, the, the, the basis for the point was that you need a properly representative House of Commons. But still, £65,000 in anyone books a lot of money. Okay, let's have some more questions. Um, let's have um, John. Uh, John, this week, um, I work for Taxpayers Alliance and I used to be a co agent at ConservativeHope.com. It's interesting to hear the this debate about getting greater representation of Parliament going further than the kind of gender, ethnicity, sexuality uh, ticking the box. Um, I would remind anyone that wants a microcosm. Of society in Parliament, and that would mean that by definition, half the members are of below average intelligence. Um, but I wondered just if we could expand on what Sean um, talked about, which is in terms of the kind of attitudes and views of working class people and how actually they are kind of seen a chasm of difference between those and those of the, if you like, the metropolitan elite which are in Parliament. I, when I was a Conservative home, I campaigned in London by elections and help friends who are conservative candidates. And I was always really interested to go to the places that never had politicians visiting them before, to find people who uh, who would come out of Europe tomorrow, who took an immensely hard line on immigration, on benefit scroungers, um, would not give a fig about creating civil partnerships, would have opposed utterly the smoking ban, for example. Um, how, what would Parliament be like? What laws would it pass if it had far more working class people in them? Right, let's give you the answer briefly if we can, in a minute, because we can get, try and get a few more questions in short. But I think, I think for me, that is, that's the top end of the argument, because when you campaign, you knock on doors, you find people who've got, there's a, a significant undercurrent that is very anti our entire PC setup. The things that we will and won't say. I remember being in Windsor and the woman telling me why she was going to vote BNP and put you know put out a window and making gestures and saying stuff. And it's hard to tell her that she was wrong because we're not we're not having those those conversations publicly. You know we're not we're not, we're not talking about um, racism in the way that most people think about it. We've made our minds up as this elite and have that discourse and everybody else sort of dis disconnect for it. And that and that is over almost every subject. We're having a different conversation. One of the big things I would do is about law and order. If you speak to the public about law and order, they're in a very different place than if you speak to professionals about law and order. Uh, to the Taxpayers Alliance, can I make it very clear that I regard myself as perfectly properly remunerated, so <laughs> <laughs> just to put that to bed. Um, I, I think that um, if we ha had an influx of working class people into Parliament, actually we would already have achieved a huge shift in our social environment. So I think that actually you would have a better discourse. I don't think you would simply get the very um, hard line stuff on race and the, the undercurrents that you will detect. Because actually I think if you did have um, many more skilled working class people in Parliament, you know, they're clever, they're bright, they're rational, uh, they're not necessarily completely gut emotional uh, people. Uh, but I do think that you, you need to talk about issues about immigration, crime, and social behavior in the language that people understand, you have to face it up. When I was the police minister and I launched the Respect Programme against antisocial behaviour, it was the middle class liberals um, who came down on me like a ton of bricks. You're stigmatising young people, you're being punitive, you're too hard, um, all of that. I know from my community that you are far more likely to be the 
fixed with antisocial behaviour if you live in a tough place uh, on an estate where basically the criminals think that they are the law and they've taken control of that estate and ordinary decent people have to fight back. So as far as I'm concerned, it is an absolutely core working class issue. Just as immigration is, all the evidence will show you that when the economy is tough, when jobs are in scarce supply, then people do look to blame other people and that's why you have to improve the economy and get more jobs and more chances for working class people and then you don't get into that blame game issue. So you have to, as a politician, as a Labour politician, you've got to take it on on the door step, you've got to talk to people in language and understand and say yes we know these are problems, now these are our solutions, you might choose not to have our solutions, you might have somebody else's, but for goodness sake have the dialogue and the conversation and don't run away from it. One of the reasons people don't canvass on council estates is because they're frightened of the voters yeah. and if you're a politician who is frightened of the public then quite frankly you're in the wrong job. <laughs> I very much understand what Jonathan said about when you knock on the doors of these states where people don't normally go, you get potentially unexpected views on, say, welfare and the economy. But I think if we did reflect the views of working class voters, you would certainly do more about fuel bills, do more about energy bills, and all political parties need to listen more to what working class voters think. I think back to the famous Herbert Morrison book when the Atlee government was thinking about wanting to join the embryonic common market. And his quote was, the Durham miners wouldn't wear it. And that, that kind of view is still expressed, that kind of left-wing Labour view about Europe is still expressed on the doorstep of working class areas. And it would be nice to be in a, in a political world where politicians did think about the views of working class voters in that way a little bit more. Okay. Well, I think if you got more working class people elected, you'd get a diversity of opinions because working class people aren't a homogenous group of people by any stretch. Uh, just to come out, I mean, you mentioned, for example, civil partnerships, um, and I think it's interesting because this is an interesting example of how often people are caricatured. There's a poll done about gay rights, uh, I think it was three years ago, and it showed that work, the, the most pro-gay rights are the C2s, the skilled and semi-skilled workers. Another recent poll showed that the region which was most pro-gay rights was uh, the North East. Uh, so I don't think it's right to just caricature people, working class people, as, you know, basically inherently socially conservative in that way, it's not often true. But it is true that issues like crime, like antisocial behaviour, like immigration, will have to be responded to properly uh, if you get more working class people elected. And I found going out to Dagenham and Barking uh, in the run-up to the last election, for example, where we were taking on the BNP and kicked out all the councillors, and rightly so. But the fact is, what people were constantly going on about there was housing. Because Labour failed to build uh, housing, you have five million people languishing in the social housing waiting list. So the BNP said, there's not enough housing to go around, so why are we giving it to them? But if we had a situation where housing had been an issue, it had actually been addressed by new Labour, then I don't think people would have been forced into the arms of the BNP. So as I say, you'll get a diversity of the opinions, but I think people do have a sense of priority. And I do think issues like housing uh, would have to be addressed, as well as things which people on the left aren't as comfortable with addressing. George Jones uh, from Wolverhampton, working class, private grammar school to ASC where I'm emeritus. <coughs> Many on the panel have mentioned local government and the decline of local government. Isn't this uh, a major cause of the problem that we're discussing? And aren't possible reforms to local government going to worsen? the position. I'm thinking of back in the time when I was growing up, working class people were keen to get on the local council and they did through the Labour Party and once on they discovered that they had all sorts of skills but they didn't know they had because they were involved through committee work in taking actual decisions and the local authority had much more power in those days than it does now when there's been centralisation and uh, constraints put upon local authorities and local authorities becoming bigger and less linked closely to their communities. Isn't it also true that if we have reform of directly elected mayors and more concentration on leaders and relegating councillors to the amorphous role of scrutiny, 
We're going to provide fewer opportunities for working class people to get involved in governing their local communities. Right, so it's grassroots. Um, okay. Yeah, I think really important points. I mean, local government, as you say, committee work was an absolute key avenue for people to come up from their community and to not see it as a career politics, but out there representing their community. And I remember speaking to people for uh, looking back at the, you know, to that tradition in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. A lot of people who were elected in that position often weren't even literate. Often, and they learned there how to represent people and that was a ladder if you like for some of them not all because it wasn't seen as a ladder it was just about representing your local community so for me that's my fear that local government got a real battering in the 80s and that's continuing today and that's one of the main ways that we've seen this shift away from working class political representation david yeah i think local government is particularly important but so is the sub-local government element empowering local people in different ways, which is through the planning system, as Alex at the back has advocated. Doing whatever we can to empower people at the local level and, and say to people, you should be empowered, we do trust you. And which is why I don't necessarily agree with you on direct elected mayors. I think direct elected mayors can give a renewed self-confidence to areas and can help draw people from working class areas into that. If you if you look at civic leadership and what that did in the <coughs> Herbert Morris, for example, came through civil civic leadership. I think local government is important. I think he wasn't a civic. He was very much a civic leader. And in an age when you had much more totemic civic leadership than you do now, I think that was really important. And if you're if you're talking about giving renewed confidence when you're bigger in certain areas, particularly in the north, I think directly elected mayors can be a way of achieving that, and also empowering people at some government level as well. Hazel, that was your route to the top through the local council route. Is that um, still relevant today or is it made hard for people now? Um, well, I actually got involved in my trade union before I became a local councillor, so I came up through both of those routes and I worked in both of those institutions, if you like, have been weakened. Uh, and I think I would accept some share of the blame for the demise of local government during our government. Um, because I think when we came to power, a lot of local government, if we're honest, was um, pretty substantial. <coughs> Um, not really up to the job, and what we did, instead of tackling that issue and bringing local government to a point where it had good people with good ideas, we bypassed local government mm -hmm. and we created a huge number of different structures, whether it was in further education, whether it was in social services, wherever, just to get around local government. I think that was a big strategic failing uh, of our government, and I think that local government at its best uh, is not just a place where you can bring working class people through, where you can learn your craft, you learn your trade and then you bring new leaders through. It's absolutely at its best, that's what it can do. But I do think there's some rose tinted glasses about what it was like because I was on my council when we had the committee structure. Half the members would turn up, they hadn't read their papers, they would get their mark to get their allowance and then they'd disappear. Um, you didn't necessarily have people who were as engaged as they should be. Um, so I, I think this sense that the committee structure was the great thing to do isn't necessarily the case. I do think elected mayors in city regions can make a big difference. And I made Greater Manchester the first city region when I was Secretary of State. And that was to give the power <coughs> for planning, housing, transport, the economy, all those big strategic things which can drive your region. I don't particularly think elected mayors in small authorities are necessarily going to make that big difference. Uh, but I would say to you, it's not just about structures. Again, unless you get quality people into the system, then local government will lose its legitimacy. And that, I think this is a big pressing problem. As much as bringing working class MPs in, bringing people of high quality into local government, making it worth their while, giving them a sense that they're making a contribution, I think is really, really important. What's the point of having the MPs if you haven't got the organisations that are vibrant and able to devolve those powers to? And that is my vision of a good um, governed country, uh, is with local government and beyond, exactly as you say, school governors, youth justice panels, that whole panoply of organisations that people can get involved with and exercise power in their communities that you need to get the best people in. Sean Griffin. I think the most important thing to, to go for is is about developing that skill. It's no good being on a working class background if you don't deliver, because what that then makes you look like, well, we should have them around because they're no good. You have to be quality first and then your background second. And then you want social structures that deliver you the opportunity to develop that yourself. Why I'm so alive to charitable work and, and, and 
and civic power because if you come from a community like mine, it's the only chance you have to run anything. So, so you really want that to happen. I, I happened here because of my local youth group that then went on to become a local community group and we, you know, we did lots of different things and campaigns. But that was because we, were, we had the opportunity to find out what the committee was. We had someone from our local council who had to deal with us. You need those lower structures to develop people because that's where the confidence comes from. If you've been, if you stood as a councillor, won or lost, it ups your confidence and you think, actually, I could do this everything sort of million miles away. And that's why local government is important. But Hazel's point is right. I have met councillors <clears throat> that I wouldn't let wash my car. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have two very quick questions together and we'll, we'll, we'll get them answered um, in, in one go. We've got any women who want to ask a question, we've not had a woman yet. <laughs> right, yeah. we'll have the, uh, to be, to, to a bit of you, you know, with Dave, a little bit of red hair, let's do that. Anybody else? Gentleman standing at the back. Uh, so we'll take one, we'll take the two together and we'll go through, I think we'll, we'll have to let you all go there. Um, I'm Emma, I'm from Essex. Um, I'm working class, so I consider myself to be. And um, I've been through a lot of issues that have been spoken about. Um, I've been a single parent, had issues with childcare, had issues with housing. I'm lucky enough, I'm married now. I've got a lot of support at home. I'm getting my education a lot later than most people. But I'm really interested in politics and um, I don't think the opportunity's been there for me to get involved. I've looked at joining the Labour Party and can't can't even find any information how to join my local Labour Party. So, um, you know, that, that's all pretty really big sum of blocks. So I just wondering, you know, what does a person from my background do to get into politics? And we'll take the other question there at the same time if we can, because we're a bit short of time and we'll deal with them all together. Hi, um, I was exchanged on the housing planning. Uh, my background is lower middle class. My mum was working class, but um, she speaks so high. It's an interesting thing that she's dropped her accent. That she's, anyway, um, the point is that there's an ugly word, an ugly phrase that describes an ugly process, which is stakeholder capture. When I've been in front of the ECOG Secretary discussing planning, all of the Labour MPs told me how terrible this was, you know, destroy the environment. None of them said there are five million people on the waiting list. None of them said that rents are going through the roof. Basically, it's a sort of middle class capture of politics where the stakeholder process and all this concentration of even great idea is capped by well off, um, well educated, professional politicians, people who work for Greens, etc. They've got lots of money, and they're not the, they, the people who are actually suffering. So, kids who go to bad schools are ignored by the teachers, people who can't afford a house are ignored by the environmental groups, and they don't speak for these groups. So, our entire system of politics has, a, has become captured by sort of civil servants who are most upper middle class themselves, and very well paid to upper middle class. Pressure groups, so I think that's, that's very unhealthy, and it means even politicians who are working on to get there get briefed by everyone and told by everyone, well, you can't think that because it's stupid. You know, why do you think we need more housing for you? I mean, they have got X, Y, and Z telling you. So I think it, the, the way that the political system works at the moment is to stop working class ideas even getting through, even to get working people there. Right, can you deal with both of those in uh, under a minute, uh, Sean, please? But this is why the two issues are linked, because for me, I got involved in my community first. If you get involved in politics, you take on their baggage. You have to get involved in your community first. So my first taste of politics was rowing about the state of the local youth club. Then it's rowing about the state of my state. Do you, do you see what I mean? And I was prepared to have a row with the people from my state and the council because I didn't have any party agenda. I, hadn't been, um, I was going to say poison. I hadn't been um, spoken to at that point. But I think it's because you have to have something to offer the politics. And I think your personal experience does. But you need to go beyond that as well. And that means that when you are high up the ladder and um, like I'm going to say something now somebody asked me who my favourite MP was and I said Frank Fields was on a television programme and I didn't quite they offered me the opportunity again to repeat and I said Frank Fields and I didn't sass what they were on about but the reason I like Frank Fields is because he's prepared to represent his lot no matter what even when it's not popular with his sort of paymasters he doesn't care he's about his constituency <coughs> And, and I, I, I respect that, and that's and he's a kind of MP you couldn't turn off of the real issues by giving him some warped brief. Oh yeah. Well, firstly, look, we need you in politics. There's, that's that's the actually number the issue. The fact is, we don't have people from your sort of background being properly represented. In terms of the Labour Party, the way to do it would be to I think to ring up the uh, nationally and they get you, put you in touch with your local constituency, Labour Party secretary, 
Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting <laughs> Hazel uh, thinking that's the wrong way to do it. Anyway, uh, but the, the key point is to do that and to, and to just force those issues you talked about on the agenda because often local Labour parties have to say, and I'm sure Hazel will agree with this, are not representative of the local community. And that is why often the Labour Party, even at a grassroots level, isn't fighting for the sorts of issues that it should be. So I hope you join and I hope you fight your corner and fight to put those on the agenda, not be elbowed out by the sorts of people already there. Um, and in terms of that, well, I think in terms of housing, by the way, I mean, I obviously want to strengthen the role of local government. The fact is, uh, if we have a more representative local government, I'd, I'd like local government to have more powers to build the housing and bring down uh, the massive social housing waiting list. And I think that above all, we need, as you say, uh, more representative systems. David? Yeah. I think the first part is a fundamental failure of communication on behalf of the political parties. But the point is, people, the fact is that people have to go and seek the other parties out and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. I think it's a major issue. But then, then a really passionate working class young person will join the political party. They'll go to a branch meeting in, in the Labour or the Tory party. They'll find the biggest two hours of tedium of their entire life and they might go back. No, nowhere can the passion of politics be more muted than in a, than a local <laughs> branch meeting. And, and I think that parties need to do something to really spice up politics for ordinary people. Alice's question, um, absolutely I agree that every consultation exercise, you look at the responses, it's from middle class lobby groups, it's from well remunerated individuals, it's not from people in the local state who are going to be directly affected. And I think that's something government needs to address. Hazel. Don't dare put Emma off her first branch meeting, because... Uh, <laughs> 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 Emma, just, just to say, it took me, I think, the best part of nine months to join the Labour Party. Um, I went to the local library, there was a Rolex file, and I found out where they met. And they met on a Tuesday night in the back room of the Dungeon Inn pub uh, in Cottington. I got there for my first branch meeting, there were six elderly men with caps. Um, and I sat there, I was the youngest person, no other women, and I, I sat down and suddenly there was like pigeon feathers. Well, I don't know were pigeons, just feathers came up. And I said, what are the feathers, what are the feathers? And the guy said to me, e love, he says, uh, we're in the room where pigeon club meets on a juice. He says, oh, no, pigeon baskets are underneath you. Yeah. <laughs> and I came out of that meeting, I was the branch secretary, and about three months later I was the CLP secretary. So that's what I was to do to you. Um, but don't, don't bring up national office. See me at the end of the meeting, I will take a note, but I will make sure you are a Labour Party member within the next month if it kills me. You can hold it. <laughs> I'll just make it happen. Um, and and I, th I thought your point was, was a really good point to make, because I've been thinking about you know, the, the, the contributions everybody's made today, and I think what Sean was talking about, confidence. Um, because actually as a working class person, maybe it's middle class people as well, I don't know, but particularly as a woman, you still have imposter syndrome, and I don't care how successful you are in your life. You know, and I've come from two up, two down in, in, in Salford, Coronation Street House, and to the British Cabinet. And at each point in that journey, I've always felt um, insecure, have I got it right, um, you know, am I meant to be here, aren't I somehow out of my um, comfort zone? Totally, I spent most of the last 20 years out of my comfort zone, meeting people, I mean, one occasion I had to go to the G20 uh, and I had to be Her Majesty's Government. And I had this wonderful old civil servant sat behind me, who was in his late 50s, he'd been everywhere. And I said to him, I'm really frightened, I've got to make this big speech, there's Russians, we went on the President's yacht down the Potomac River, you know, things I'd never dreamt about doing. And he said to me, um, Hazley said, just forget who you are, you're not Hazel Blears, you're actually here as the representative of Her Majesty's Government, and that was fine, as soon as I thought that was okay. But I think when you are in positions of power, it's very easy to feel intimidated by people that you think know more than you, who are better educated than you, who've got a better class background than you, and that doesn't go away, unfortunately. Um, it gets less because you feel that you've achieved and you can have your say. But that issue about stakeholder capture, that's a, a new phrase, a horrible phrase, but that issue that people who are in positions of power can even influence um, our democratic system, I think is quite um, a, a pernicious one and quite damaging. And I think I would just say to every MP, every minister, stick to what you believe in and really fight really hard for the things you care about. Well, I think we've run out of time now. Um, I, I just think it's been an absolutely brilliant debate. Um, four great ambassadors uh, for re-engagement with the ordinary people out there on the streets of Britain. Um, they spoke with great passion. And in fact, I think that's what the I would sum up what we've heard today is the passion that is needed to engage people um, at grassroots level in politics is there. It's a challenge for all of us. Um, I first personally feel 
re-engage to have and listen to, the, to them about the need as a journalist to get the importance of politics and getting involved in politics across to our readers. And I think if some of you have gained some thoughts along that way in, in your own roles, then today's been worthwhile. Uh, we've heard about bread and butter politics, these shocking figures about the number of uh, non-working class people who are involved. And I think we do need politics to be representative of society at large. And perhaps that's a challenge for all of us. So um, I'd like to thank Policy Exchange for, in, for setting up this excellent debate today. I think uh, they've looked after as well and, uh, uh, and they've picked a, an excellent panel. Uh, and thanks also to Hazel Blears, Owen Jones, Sean Bailey and David Skelton for their excellent contributions.